So, a very, warm, a very warm welcome to this session on the Swiss AI Initiative, a regional contribution uh, to a global development. I'm Martin Reimann, I'm from EPFL. I'm also the president of the Digital Switzerland Foundation. And I'm super pleased to, uh, to moderate this session where we'll have two parts. There will be a presentation at the beginning for, for you to get the background information about the initiative and then a very high level panel where we'll be asking interesting questions to know more about it. So without further ado, I, will, I am introducing Antoine, Professor Antoine Boslu from EPFL. Uh, we are, it, it is one of the brains behind the Swiss AI initiative, so we are very proud to have, it, to have him here. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and he has 10 minutes to, very hard job of 10 minutes to explaining you everything about the initiative. Oh, okay, well I'll stand over here then. Uh, so thanks everybody uh, for joining us today uh, to discuss the Swiss AI initiative. Um, what I think is probably one of the most uh, exciting uh, programs and, and opportunities in, in public sector research, definitely here in Switzerland, but uh, possibly globally as well. So you know, to start off, I you know always like to, to preface a discussion about uh, the Swiss AI initiative and AI in general to talk about where we are in the AI revolution. And I really like this quote that a colleague of mine, uh, Jim Laris, uh, said to me a few months ago about the fact that generative AI is really the fourth wave of the computing revolution, following previous waves that you know fundamentally transform society, such as the personal computer. Uh, which changed ultimately how we could access information, the web, which made it so that we could access all of the information in the world, and then mobile, which ultimately made it that we could access that information wherever we were. I think generative AI is another such transformation that's fundamentally going to change how that information is given to us when we try to access it and ultimately have the same level of impact that these previous four revolutions uh, gave us. Um, however, despite these, these incredible opportunities and the way in which this technology is going to transform our society, there's also a lot of challenges uh, that are here and that you know, are here right now. Um, you know, one of the first ones is that you know, a lot of these advances have been driven um, by advances in you know, what we call scale, which is essentially we made the machines uh, that actually power AI a lot bigger. Uh, a lot more powerful, and as a result, only a few places right now are capable of developing these technologies at scale. And naturally, that gives them a massive competitive advantage, uh, huge trade secrets as they develop these technologies, which means that ultimately they do it behind closed doors, and they share that information a lot less than they used to. If you were an AI 10 years ago, it was this beautiful ecosystem where everything was made public so that everybody could know about it. That dynamic has shifted drastically as ultimately AI has become more of a product than just a technology capable of providing huge amounts of rewards and gains uh, to the companies that, uh, that drive it. Naturally, as these technologies stay behind closed doors and the details of how they're developed aren't made public, it leads to systems that we might consider less trustworthy uh, in general. We're already dealing in AI with a trust deficit based off the fact that the algorithms that we use uh, for modern AI tend to be black boxes for which the, the internal mechanisms aren't necessarily perfectly understood. Now, as we keep more and more of these secrets behind closed doors, it just exacerbates that problem and we end up uh, with algorithms that we don't necessarily trust as much in how they behave uh, in the applications uh, that we want. And finally, you know, these combine to essentially uh, give us an unprepared society for what's to come. When you have this type of fundamental transformation, without the fundamental understanding uh, that is supposed to be behind it, we end up in a situation where we as a society are reacting to developments that are made in the AI space rather than driving them. So what needs to change to kind of alter that balance? Um, well, the first thing that I would say needs to change is that we need to be able to systematically investigate the models that are created so that we can ultimately use those findings to drive changes where we have more control over how the next generation of models is being created. And that requires more access than just being able to talk to the model and see what it says back to us. It requires being able to have access to the weights, understanding the data sets that are available, understanding the training algorithms that are used to produce them, as well as the infrastructure uh, that they're actually trained on. And that requires transparent releases, where companies or public organizations that build these systems should release all of these materials to the public so that they're able to actually use those materials to then improve the next generation. And finally, there needs to be engagement from all levels of society. 
you know, ultimately the real value creation of AI isn't necessarily the algorithms itself, it's how they get deployed uh, to the rest of society and to, to, the, to the rest of the landscapes uh, where this technology is going to be used at the end of the day. And so the goal of the Swiss AI initiative, which is that uh, opportunity that I'd introduced you to earlier, is to essentially drive this change and to be able to develop the capabilities, the know-how, and the talent to build trustworthy generative AI systems here in Switzerland, and particularly that are aligned uh, with Swiss values. And finally, also to make these resources available for the benefit of Swiss society and global actors. So essentially take the solutions that I proposed earlier to the challenges that are here, and develop an ecosystem here in Switzerland that can actually uh, you know, drive that, tr uh, that transformation forward. And so what are our guiding principles by which uh, we're seeking to accomplish this? Well, the first is to actually be able to build foundation models here in Switzerland. Foundation models being uh, you know, the base of most of the modern AIs uh, that are so impressive, such as ChatGPT. Without being able to access and understand how these models were trained, the data they were trained on, we ultimately can't probe them as resolutely as if we are only dealing with models that are released to the public without these details being known. The second key is human AI alignment. Once these foundation models are available, it still takes quite a bit of training and development in order to actually uh, produce a system that can be shared with the public. Understanding how those steps by which we align, you know, the base foundation model that we have, uh, with the systems that we want the public to interact with is crucial to actually be able to build safe systems because this is where we really get to update how the model behaves in a human environment. Importantly, we need to rely on communities of experts to actually red team these systems and measure and mitigate some of the problems that might arise early on. Things like they may be biased towards particular demographics, they may lie and not tell the truth, um, they may reveal private information about users that they found on the web, and they may actually exacerbate many of the societal risks that we already see today. All of this requires a community effort uh, to actually identify so that we can already implement solutions within the development pipeline before it goes out uh, to users. And then finally, we need to actually be able to work with stakeholders to deploy these systems in the real applications uh, where they'll actually function and get feedback within those systems as ultimately we can do as many intrinsic evaluations as we want, but really the important thing is how we observe the interaction that it has within the systems that we deploy them and make sure that we're making changes that ultimately operate within, that are ultimately useful to that environment. And ultimately our goal by specifically focusing on these guiding principles is to be able to build large scale open AI models for key sectors of the Swiss economy, Swiss society, but ultimately the global society as well, that focuses on the most important institutions that we have here as parts of the public domain. Things like educating and training uh, the next generation of students, workers, scientists, making fundamental scientific advancements um, that academia has led the drive on um, for, many, for many centuries. Being able to you know, augment the clinical and public health systems that every citizen relies on. And so many more applications that you know, are fundamental to how our society is set up. And as an early success of how we've been doing this, you know, I'd like to draw attention to a work uh, called Metatron that was recently released uh, by members of the Swiss AI Initiative um, that ultimately you know, really put transparency at the center of what it was trying to do, releasing open data, releasing the model weights after it was trained, releasing the source code uh, that it was trained on. And ultimately, it ended up being the best performing open source MetaLem, fully open MetaLem, while many of the others still have information that are hidden behind closed doors. And importantly, it was also in range of some of the most powerful commercial LLMs out there, with the only ones being better, having around still 10x the scale. So ultimately, we can you know, be uh, uh, producing systems that we can study in the same scale uh, that we want in order to have the findings that we produce be useful uh, to society going forward. And so why should Switzerland lead the way in this? Well, we already have many of the institutions that are necessary to really have an impact here. You know, big one being uh, the large scale infrastructure by CSCS that's built an Alps cluster with around 10,000 H100 GPUs, essentially the fuel behind developing modern scale AI. We have excellent innovation and tech transfer um, capabilities through the SDSC uh, that allows us to actually produce uh, and transfer the findings that we have uh, towards the societal institutions uh, that we want to work with. And finally, we have some of the best research and development talent in the world through the EPFL and ETH AI centers, uh, which ultimately are going to be driving this development and this fundamental research. 
And so on that note, you know, the last thing we still need, however, is strong collaboration partnerships to make sure that we are interacting with the right stakeholders um, to make this initiative as successful as possible. Because ultimately, the strongest collaboration partnerships is going to produce strong AI development ecosystems. And so we're excited uh, to work with partners here in Switzerland and abroad uh, to produce open foundation models, uh, exploitable application optimized AIs, and very importantly, uh, a new generation of specialized AI talent that can drive the next generation of these advancements forward. So on that note, thank you very much, and looking forward to working with many of you. So, Many thanks, Antoine, uh, for this uh, very compact presentation of the AI initiative, Swiss AI initiative is. Now it's time for calling the panel, mem panelists on the stage. Please come with us. And I will very briefly present the people we have in the panel that will help us to understand even better the initiative. So I start with Professor Jan Hesthaven, Professor at EPFL and Vice President for Academic Affairs. Then Professor Andreas Krause from ETHZ. Andreas has so many hats that it, I will have to select some. So he's, <laughs> among other things, uh, the academic co-director of the Swiss Data, Data Science Center that has, be, has been mentioned by, by Antoine. Then he's also uh, the chair of the uh, ETHZ AI Center, and finally the member of the Swiss AI Steering Committee. Then we have Professor Anna Klimovic from ETHZ. She's also a member of the uh, Swiss AI Steering Committee. Then we have Sabine Sustrang, professor at EPFL as well. And, and that will be very interesting for us, uh, president of the Swiss Science Council. And finally, we have also Mark Walder, who will be the one defending the, the rights of the economy. He is uh, the founder of Digital Switzerland and the CEO of Rangier et AG. <coughs> so many thanks for all of you for being here. I will be basically asking questions that I hope that will enlighten the audience. So I will start with you, Jan. If you look at how people perceive generative AI, there is the feeling that it is all dominated by big industrial players. There is Google, there is Meta, there is uh, OpenAI. So a bit of a provo provo provocative question for you as a VP of Academic Affairs, why do we still need academics for driving the progress in generative AI? It's an interesting question. It's a good question. Um, let me try and answer it sort of with maybe with two different elements. One is universities have been educating people for 800 years. I don't foresee this changing. Uh, so obviously the educational element is, is very important, but I think there will be a change as we go forward because there is a lot of expertise at a level that we haven't quite seen in the private sector. And I, I imagine I foresee a, a, a future where also on the educational side, there will be a much stronger collaboration between the private sector and universities, uh, both in sort of advanced education of our graduates, but also in areas uh, of upskilling, lifelong learning, uh, where maybe more practical elements can be uh, of essential uh, importance. So that's sort of number one. The second one is we shouldn't forget what universities can do that the private sector cannot. We can allow ourselves to fail. Because when we fail, we still educate. So what is special about universities is that we hedge our research with education. So you can do long-term, high risk, but even if you fail, it's okay because you have educated the young. Companies, private sector, has a much harder time justifying that, certainly for a long time. Universities can, and that is the unique role of the university in providing uh, an environment where you can allow yourself to take very high risk long-term. So that would be my two elements. Many thanks, Jan. I will take no. I will I will break the order in because I will jump on the other side of the of the of the row because we have Mark Valder and uh, Mark is due, uh, due to your position in uh, in digital Switzerland. You are a very privileged observer of the private sector in Switzerland, especially in the digital domain. Another provocative question to you: Why would industry need still initiatives where there are a strong representation of academia? for making progress in AI. Yes, thank you, Martin. Thank you for, for being here, and thank you for giving me a, a short slot. Uh, I've been running around Davos now for three days, as you all, and um, my core topic was the topic we have here, Gen AI. Uh, 
never we have discussed what the question exactly was now. So, so the question you asked me has not been a topic so far in Davos. So I congratulate you for this initiative. This is a wonderful initiative and a very important initiative. Second thought is when I had the... Uh, the, on, the honor to, to, to be the founder of Digital Switzerland it was a small table. Uh, I think Martin uh, was one of the earliest who, who, who came with us. And uh, we decided that if we want to really uh, make a difference, we need to have a multi-stakeholder approach. So if you just have uh, around the table UBS credit, well, Credit Suisse is not here anymore, but if you would have the insurance and the telcos and <laughs> the banks, etc., uh, then it's fine. But if you don't have academia, if you don't have the public sector, if you don't have politics here, if you don't have the administration at the table, and this is what you're doing, the multi-stakeholder approach, you're actually going into a, a one-way street. So that's my, my second remark. And the third remark is, I was very attentive uh, at the presentation that we just saw. And let me turn it into the opposite. If we don't have a democratic way, uh, if we don't have a trustworthy way, if we don't have a prepared society, if we don't have the skills, if we will have black boxes, then the private sector, everything the private sector does is nothing. And that's why I think the private sector is obliged, and if he's, if he's intelligent, he will support this initiative. Many thanks, Mark. Now that we've been having the two extremes, we can start to dig in the heart of the initiative with our three other part, uh, pan panelists. Andreas, I will, I will be turning to you for a question which is very important to me. One of the main driving factors of the initiative is that it's a collaborative initiative between many research labs. Could you give us some arguments on why, what is the type of research that can be achieved in a such a way that could not be achieved as an indiv individual work in the labs? Thank you, Martin, for this great question. Uh, so uh, building modern uh, large language models, foundation models, large AI models, is really a substantial enterprise. So it requires teams with lots of expertise, engineering, systems expertise, um, data, computer infrastructure, um, optimization, machine learning, human computer, uh, AI interface, and of course, application um, domain expertise. Really a broad range of expertise that goes far beyond what normal research group really entails. Right. And so within the Swiss AI Consortium, um, uh, we're really excited to have leading expertise in these different areas, as well as the spirit and enthusiasm and also incentive structure to uh, really work uh, together to make this happen. Uh, and so uh, this will hopefully uh, allow us to really contribute to exciting applications of large-scale AI models in various different domains, education, healthcare, um, <coughs> robotics, uh, just to name a few. You saw some of the slides. I also want to uh, quickly uh, highlight, uh, so yesterday we launched this International Computer and AI Network, where the Swiss AI is really a co-initiator, right, that really started this uh, together with the Swiss um, um, uh, Department for Federal uh, Affairs, uh, for Foreign Affairs, uh, and many other partners, both national and inter international, uh, that will really allow us to use uh, AI uh, to address um, challenging and pressing problems around sustainable development uh, that are of global relevance, also humanitarian efforts. Uh, so this is, I think, super exciting in terms of the application domain. Also partners like the Swiss Data Science Center will really allow us to adapt uh, the models to different use cases in science and industry. Uh, so we really set up very well to do that. And what's also super important uh, and that was also mentioned is that this will just also provide us a basis to hopefully innovate in foundations of large-scale AI to really look at the next generation of trustworthy uh, AI technology built here in Switzerland. Many thanks, Andreas. Now I'm switching to you, Anna. You are a specialist of computational infrastructures, among other things. So I have a um, question that is bothering me quite a bit. In generative AI, there is a strong wish for having huge computational infrastructures. That's specific. If you are in civil engineering, you're not like building through bridges at all steps. So could you tell us why these large infrastructures are so crucial for progress in generative AI? Yes, absolutely. So um, these large foundation models, as Antoine also alluded to in his talk, uh, are really cr scale is critical to, to their success in terms of scale of the data that they train on, so the storage that we need to, to store all those resources, as well as the computational intensity of these models. Um, so serving these models can easily uh, require your hundreds of GPUs, let alone training them, uh, which can easily scale to hundreds to, to thousands of GPUs. And so the fact that for the Swiss AI initiative, our starting point is um, this computing infrastructure in 
the Alp supercomputer with 10,000 H100 GPUs uh, is, is really huge. Uh, this is really unprecedented scale uh, that puts us in a great position to uh, explore these models and further develop them. Okay. Now, Sabine, I, I will be getting to you, not as the brilliant, brilliant scientist that you are, but as the president of the science, uh, Swiss, science, uh, Swiss Science Council, because you have a broad view. Uh, one of the selling factors of the initiative is trust bossy AI that is aligned with ethical and societal values, Swiss in our case. My feeling is that uh, this is somehow related to the fact that generative AI is a domain where there are no regulations, no standards, no norms. Do you think that, what is your opinion about that? Why is ethics and uh, social alignment with social values so important for us? Indeed, that's totally correct. Think about it. We have a mature industry that's basically not been regulated for decades. It's called social media. And think about the mess that created. We cannot afford it. We cannot afford to pump out products and, and usage scenarios for consumers um, and, you know, your neighbor to use without knowing the danger. So we need to have regulations relatively soon. Now, I'm not, uh, not for regulations on the innovation. I'm just for the regulation on the applications and, and the usage of it. But now, and that's the key, and that's why we need something like Swiss AI. Regulation by its nature is always behind. It will never be in front. We'll never regulate something we don't even know it's going to come. We'll always be behind. And so if I, as a consumer, as a company, want to use an AI product, I need to be able to trust whoever gives me that product. And we have discussed the trust before. We heard the trust before, and this is exactly a key element. Think about it, you buy a toy for your kid. Are you gonna trust it from a company you know is going to actually follow all the regulations that you have about the materials can be used? Or are you gonna order it on the internet, it coming from anywhere, we have no clue what kind of chemistry is in your toy's composition? You wouldn't do that, you wouldn't trust. And so coming back to the Swiss AI, if we do have foundational models for which companies or also academia can build products on, but we know it's going to be transparent. We know it's following open science principles. We will have much more trust, or at least I will. Thanks, Sammy. Now, I, I will break a bit the order because uh, I, I, I won't take advantage of having Antoine still on, this, on the stage. Um, Antoine, you've been active in uh, natural language processing uh, since uh, many years. You've been seeing the progress in that field, and uh, I guess that you have been, like other researchers, impressed by what can be achieved with the Gen AI, the large LLMs. But there, is, there are two things, the linguistic competence, the fact that you can talk well, and what you say. And uh, that is absolutely, it is absolutely amazing how well the system talk. Sometimes they do quite severe mistakes in terms of content. What is your expert feeling about that as an improvement in the future? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I mean, my expert feeling is that it's, you know, it's exactly uh, an embodiment of the issues that we face right now. Um, essentially, you have, you know, nicely split the abilities in terms of linguistic competence and, you know, let's we'll call it factual competence along this line. But it's, in many cases, is, is just a, a taxonomy, you know, that we create to identify the issues that we see. Issues that we don't necessarily understand, why these systems are so good at saying things that seem so convincing, while in the end also using details, facts, supporting information that is completely made up uh, half of the time. And so for me, it's, uh, it's, it's a perfect reflection on why an initiative like this is needed, is to kind of dive deep into those details with access to the full spate of resources that we have to actually make a dent into that fundamental knowledge. Yeah, let me turn back to you. We've heard that, well, there is what is crucial in the initiative is to have the right infrastructure, the brilliant, research, brilliant researchers, et cetera. But there is one word that we hear again and again is talent. If we want to do something with what will be created in this initiative, we need the people to make it run. So what is your take as the VP of EPFL for the Swiss academic environment to be able to produce and to keep the talents that we need for these technologies? 
So it's a it's a global it's a global challenge, and and we we also have to admit that that competing directly for the for the most desirable talent with the private sector, for instance, is is uh, is difficult. And and I uh, wonder about a future uh, and worry about a future where, in fact, uh, we are not able to compete for the very best uh, talent at the at the educational institutions, but they are rather attracted to the private sector which means it'll be the second best that will educate the next generation. I think this is a, a challenge that we, are, that we are potentially facing. I'm not so worried about whether we can attract uh, the youngest talent uh, into the institutions. I, I think we can. But, but I think this revolution that we go through and very much along the lines of what, what uh, Sabina Sustrich just talked about, it also opens the question of what is it that we teach this new generation of, of uh, of, uh, of talent, do we just teach them the technical skills, which is sort of perhaps what we have been doing in the past, or do we teach them the technical skills and a little bit more about what is the impact of the skills that you, that you learn and how, how does that impact society? So I think there's a, there's a change there that is driven perhaps by, by some of these thoughts. Uh, and, and finally, and I already mentioned it, I think in, in terms of the talent and talent development, I think we also look, have to look very carefully as institutions on how we can uh, also uh, upskill a lot of talent that perhaps haven't had the opportunity or haven't taken the opportunity early on, but nevertheless is a, is a resource that can be used. Uh, so so um, lifelong learning, continued ed, it's, it's, I think, an area where the institutions need to take a role, which they haven't done before. And again, I, I'm, I'll be jumping to, uh, to, to you, Mark seen from the other side of the fence, this notion of talents. Uh, Swiss industry is, 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 is fighting for keeping them here yeah. very hard. Yeah, I, I had to laugh when I heard from the vice president that it's, uh, you know, you're losing it to the private sector. Well, we're losing it to the four, to the four or five Americans. So, <laughs> so, 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 so private sector has, has, has exactly the same problem. And, and if we see, by the way, this is, this is this is something uh, I have learned here, probably not really new, but it has been reconfirmed. At the end, it, we risk that it's going to be in the hands of four or five and maybe six, right? Question then is, where are they coming from? You know the answer. So that leads us to Europe, and we haven't talked about China yet. So the thing is, so it, it's really a delicate moment. I think it's a good moment at the moment because, because we, as, as you said, as everybody here says, you're basically you know, trying to find the right direction. Let me throw in one study that I have been confronted with uh, uh, during the WEF now several times. I don't, know, I don't know the origin of the study, but it has been quoted so many times, so I guess it's true, which, which is not always the case <laughs> to social media. <laughs> I'm referring to you, but still. Um, um, it wasn't on social media, it was on panels. Okay. So maybe this makes it better. So the study goes uh, to, I think, about 25 countries, uh, a big study. They did, so what, what will you do? You, a normal citizen with AI and Gen AI and the tools that will be delivered to you, one third said, good, I embrace and I use. One third said, hands off because of trust, etc., and fear. And one third said, I don't know. Let's count the one third, I don't know, to the more pessimistic uh, part. Again, to the private sector, Martin. Uh, of course, it's fun to play with ChatGPT once or twice a day. Actually, th th this, I don't really understand the hype because more than you know, once or twice a day, you don't really interact with ChatGPT. But still, uh, this is only the very beginning. If two thirds of the population don't have a good feeling towards AI and the tools they're going to be used in whatever way, and there will be many more ways than, than, than we see now, just the chat functions, then the private sector has a huge problem. So this basically closes the circle again. Now I will be digging a bit deeper with you, uh, Anna, to see whether the selling factor that we have in the Swiss AI initiative, this Alps very large infrastructure, will in fact not be put out of business by your brilliant research or people that are in your field, where the goal is in fact to invent algorithms that are much more efficient, therefore could be able to do the same outputs on a much smaller infrastructure. So isn't, isn't it this race that we are observing today for 
always bigger infrastructure something that is truly necessary? Or are these two aspects, the progress in research in optimizing and the infrastructure complementary? question. So indeed, uh, we're doing a lot of work in uh, trying to make these models more efficient, both from the perspective of the algorithms and the uh, structures of the models themselves, as well as how we schedule the workloads onto the actual hardware and so on. So for example, we're looking into how you can share uh, hardware underneath the hood between multiple training jobs that are running at the same time uh, to get the best utilization. Um, but as we make these, you know, the, running these models more and more efficient, um, what that enables us to do is simply run uh, more models, more workloads, train on more data, uh, explore a wider range of use cases. So um, I think these goals actually really align that by making things more efficient, we allow ourselves with that infrastructure to do even more. And so it will remain very useful. Sabine, you, 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 you've been promoting the notion of ethical values, societal values. That has been said everywhere. How do we do so? What are the factors that are important? Is it open source principles, transparency? What are the concrete things that can allow us to truly achieve these goals that we have? Well, there's going to be many, right? Because it is in itself somewhat of the fourth generation, as Antoine said. And there's the, every generation will have its own kind of um, things to do. But we do have, in science at least, this open science principles, right? And they're based on transparency, on trust, and on repeatability. That's another kind of thing we need to know. Because we know these are somewhat of the black boxes, but at least I want to be sure, if I put one input in my foundation model, it better be the same output every day, which is not guaranteed with some of the products we're actually getting. So this kind of like, you know, totally Accountability, account of open science is on accountability, it's on repeatability. I can, if, even if I do not know what all the trillion parameters uh, of the model do, can at least count on a stable performance. And if the performance is improved, then I get notified this is going to be a different kind of model behind it. So this is, I think, the one of the reasons behind it. It still will not replace some regulation some norms, some standards that we need to be developed for this. And maybe if I can just, if I may, you know, that every time you talk about regulation in AI, everybody says, oh no, you know, oh, it's going to be for nothing. There's going to be so many bad actors who are going to go live on it anyway. Well, if you do have foundation models on the open um, science, you know, the science principle, it's harder to get around them. Because then you can just say, well, are you certified by Swiss AI that you're actually using our model, or are you not? And if you're telling me you're using some model from somewhere, then I'm going like, well, then maybe I don't trust you, even if you have open in the title of your company. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Xavi. And finally, for you, uh, Andreas, because you've been advocating already about um, the importance of having a large coalition of research units um, that are trying to unfold the same goal. Um, there is another dim dimension in that, which is having experts from different applicative domains. Why do you think is this, which is the case that we have in the Swiss AI initiative, why do you think this is also crucial while it's not necessarily so crucial in other uh, research domains? Well, I think that's one of the unique strengths that we can play out in this consortium and also right in a strong scientific base. There's lots of really exciting applications of AI for science, and we really have leading experts in various different domains. And so bringing them together in an interdisciplinary context uh, in that capacity will really allow us to do things that would be difficult anywhere else. Thanks. So now I'm looking at the time. We have the time for maybe two questions. We have a microphone. I've seen one and second hand. So over there. That's true. Well, thank you very much for this uh, extraordinary panel and this great, uh, great initiative. My name is Daniel Stauffacher. I'm the founder of ICT for Peace Foundation, and I'm also a former ambassador of Switzerland. Now, you have a title here, which is Swiss AI Initiative, Regional Contributions to Global development. Now, Andreas, you mentioned already the aspect of international affairs. And what now the question is, what could Switzerland do to implement that uh, great goal, uh, which I fully support? Is it to development cooperation or international science cooperation or, or whatever? Thank you very much. 
Jan. Oh, Andreas. Okay, let me directly re respond to that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Right. So that's exactly the idea and vision behind this network that we launched um, yesterday. Right. And uh, to to really. Uh, develop specific use cases on AI to make sure that AI becomes the technology that really leaves no one behind, right? That uh, has a uh, benefit uh, for all of us, right? Both around sustainable development, also around humanitarian uh, efforts, right? And of course, does require international collaboration. I think we are very well positioned here uh, in Switzerland, ready to be uh, key facilitators of this, and we are happy to help with the SSAI initiative. Thank you, Andres. Second question. Hello, my name is Tao Nguyen. I'm the founder of Equal Care. And thank you for the initiative and the informative panel today. So we were talking about having correct AI that the population can trust, ethical AI that is stable. Then as a woman, it comes to me, what gender bias is a really big topic in finding talent, in being ethical, in being stable, and being correct. So what is the initiative's perspective on the gender bias? Sabine. I don't have an answer, but I have an experience. And I, you have to give me 90 seconds. So, and I don't want, it's, it's not about Ringier here, but it's an initiative that has been done, started by Ringier uh, four years ago. It's called Equal Voice. Equal Voice measures how many women actually appear on digital platforms in media. The underrepresentation in media globally is 85% men and 15% women. So it, we implemented this in about 60 media brands already in about uh, nine countries, and we reach 60 million people per month, uh, per week, excuse me, with this. Uh, so now we extended this into the Gen AI space, and we did a couple of tests. So if you, on any large language model, uh, prompt uh, a successful CEO in his office. Now, we did, I think, 120 tests. It's the white male, more hair than me, <laughs> younger than me, white, in a beautiful office. A wonderful question. Uh, and that with this, I hand it over to the experts. Sabine. It's a very good question, and it's a very hard one. So let's now kid ourselves, right? This has nothing to do with intelligence, what we're talking about it, it's machine learning. Machine learning needs data. And depending on your application, you use different data to learn from. You know, the large model basically suck up all the internet, and the internet is unfortunately still full of predominantly, right. So. <laughs> Having said that, oh, um, by the way, also a little parentheses. Some of you might be familiar with a database called ImageNet, which was one of the largest image databases. And that was based on WordNet, which is basically a text description for it. When it came to women, the description in WordNet was the gender that brings baby into the world, or something like that. So, you know, kind of limited description to what we could do. Um, and so this is... Uh, <laughs> exactly. So anyway, so this is, this is what you still have in a lot of this data. But I think, if nothing else, here I'm quite optimistic. We see what the problem is. We can counterbalance it. We have certain applications, and here I'm thinking medical, right? At least, for example, we have lots of mammography data. That's probably one of the best AI applications is trying to find breast cancer because we have a lot of this data. And so there's a lot of positive things. One just needs to actually develop it, and one needs to be conscious of it. Many thanks, Sabine. We are unfortunately at the end of the time we can afford, so it... Uh uh, what I can do now is to first thank many, um, address many thanks to our speaker and our panelists for the great contribution that we have today. Thank our audience. We didn't have time for so many questions, but you know that's the, the rule of the game. Let's switch to the next, uh, next panel, and I will ask our panelists and speakers to gather over there for the traditional photo post-session photo. Thank you.